Welcome back. Now, if all of your applications were stateless and never needed data storage, life would be much simpler. However, in the real world, we need data storage. We've talked about the different layers that make up a Docker image, and the last layer is a writable layer, which means applications that need write access will work just fine. However, as soon as you stop the container, whatever you've written there is gone, which means using a writable layer is not an effective way to handle persistent storage. Luckily, Docker provides three options, which are bind mounts, volumes, and in-memory options called tempfs, as in temporary file system. Bind mounts have been around for a while. They work by mounting a file or directory that resides on the host inside of the container. This remains an effective mechanism that allows you to access files from the host inside of your container. And once the container stops, the data remains because it lives on the host. The downside here is that bind mounts aren't as decoupled from the host as you might like. You need to know the exact path on the host that you want to mount in the container. The upside is this could work really well for development because you don't need to rebuild the image to access the new source code. So you make changes to your source and it reflects immediately. Docker still supports bind mounts because they work well. However, the preferred way to handle persistent file storage is with volumes. Volumes are basically just bind mounts, except that Docker manages the storage on the host. So you don't need to know the fully qualified path to a file or directory. This makes it easier when working cross-platform because Docker handles the volume. Volumes aren't limited to the local host file system either. They allow you to use different drivers. The drivers support the use of external storage mechanisms such as Amazon's S3, Google Cloud Storage, and more. Now, when you stop a container that's using volumes or bind mounts, the data remains on the host. In contrast, the third option, tempfs, is different. Tempfs, as in temporary file system, is an in-memory file system. From inside the container, you still interact with the files the same way you would any other file. However, the difference is that tempfs is not persistent. Because tempfs allows for file system access for the life of the running container, it's commonly used to hold sensitive information. So that includes things like access tokens. Now let's try these out. To test out bind mounts and volumes, I've created an app in Go that will loop 50 times and it's going to write the host name and the loop counter to a file. The file is specified as a command line argument so you can pass in any file you want. So this is going to allow us to write some data to the volumes from multiple containers. And I've already compiled this, the binary is in the same directory as the Docker file. Now this Docker file for this demo is pretty basic. It's based on the scratch image and it copies the binary to the root directory. And finally, it sets the default command to run the binary, and then it passes in the path where we want the data to be written to. So that's our volume. The directory of slash logs is going to be the mounted directory, and the name my app is just an arbitrary name that I've made up, so it has no real meaning. Here in the terminal, you can see that there are no containers. And here's a list of existing images. Okay, in this directory, you can see the Docker file and the binary. So now it's time to actually test this out. So let's test out bind mounts first. And for that, we need a directory to mount. So I've created a directory under var demo logs, and you can see here that it's empty. Okay, let's build the image that we'll use for the demo. Let's call it scratch underscore volume. Okay, that didn't take long, and here it is in the list. So now, I want to paste in a command that I have copied to my clipboard. Most of the parameters used here have been used throughout the course, with the exception of this mount flag. This is the most current way to specify different storage options, since it's the most flexible. Notice that the type is set to bind, then you need to specify the directory source, and the destination. The source is the directory on the host you want to mount, and the destination is the path inside the container where it will be mounted. 
In this example, the slash var demo logs directory will be available inside the container at slash logs. Recall that this image is going to write some data to a file that lives inside of the mounted slash logs directory. So let's start up a few containers because I want to show how multiple containers have access to the same directories and files. Okay, now that this has been running for a moment, there should be some data that has been written from the container to the bind mount. So here you can see the last 30 lines written to the my app file that the application created. If I print out the unique host IDs in the file, here we go, you can see that there are four entries. If I compare them against the container IDs, you can see that each container was able to write to the same shared file. Remember that when using a bind mount, the directories and files are managed by you and not Docker. So this means that the listing here for volumes will show zero results. However, if you list off the files underneath slash var demo logs, you're going to see the my app file is still available to use on the host. Okay, let's prune these containers so we can clean things up a bit. And there we go. So now let's try the volume. Here's roughly the same command as before, except the type is now set to volume. Also, with a bind mount, the source is the fully qualified path, and now it's not. Since Docker manages it, you can just use a name for the volume. Docker allows you to create the volume with the docker volume command. However, if you use the mount flag with a type set to volume and that volume doesn't already exist, it's going to automatically be created for you. Notice how it shows up under the volumes as local volumes and it's named logs. Docker manages the location of the volume, which you can find using the docker volume inspect command. Notice here that the mount point is under slash var lib docker volumes. Let's start up a few more containers. Okay, great. Now we can use tail to show the results streaming in. Let's use the tail command to refresh, say, every second. Okay, notice all of the results from the different hosts are being appended. Let's once again display all of the unique IDs to see that all of these containers successfully were able to write their data. So let's cat the file, and then let's cut based on a space, and we'll grab the second field, and we'll pipe through sort, and then we'll cap it off piping through the unique binary. Okay. And you can see we have four IDs. Listing off the existing containers, you can see it's the same IDs. So with a bit more bash scripting, we could sort the container IDs. And there, you can see that the IDs are in the same order now. Just makes it easier to compare. So what does all of this actually show? Now, both bind mounts and volumes are roughly the same. However, volumes are managed by Docker. Both allow multiple containers to access the same mount points, and both keep the data on the host after the containers are stopped or removed. Let's check out the final storage option type, which is the temporary file system tempfs. Tempfs is similar to the others in that you can create it with the mount flag. However, since it's only creating an in-memory construct, you don't need to specify a source directory because there's nothing on the host that's going to persist that info. For this demo, we'll use the Ubuntu image so we can create an interactive bash session. The type here is tempfs and the destination is set to slash logs. So inside the container, we'll have a directory under slash logs that behaves just like any other storage option except that it only exists while the container is running. There is nothing here under slash logs. So let's add a file. We can echo some text to standard out. 
and we'll call the file demo. Okay, now I'm gonna exit the container to keep it running with control P followed by control Q. So you can see here based on the listed containers that it's still running. If I list off the volumes, you can see that it doesn't show any new volumes. I show this to demonstrate that all three storage types use the same mount flag, however, they are all implemented in a different way. If we start a new Ubuntu container with a tempfs mount, we can see that unlike bind mounts and volumes, tempfs is container specific. So let's list off the files under slash logs, and it's empty. Now let's reattach to the container with the ID starting with 4D. All right, if we look at the logs directory and print the demo file to screen, you can see that the demo file text is there and the file still exists. That's because the container hasn't been stopped. So while it's running, that information is available. So now if we stop the container by exiting out, okay, let's list off so you can see that it's stopped. And there it is. Now let's start the container again. Okay. And now let's attach to that container. And here we are back at the bash prompt. And if we list off the contents of the logs directory, you can see that it's now empty. TempFS is a great option when you need file system access that's isolated to the container. So this is really great for things like sensitive information, access tokens, or any sort of uh, sensitive information that your app might need while the container is running is useful for this sort of mount. So storage is a crucial part of most applications, and that's why Docker provides you with options. Each of these is a viable option depending on the use case. However, if you're not sure which type to use, then volumes are probably the safest bet. All right, let's wrap up here. In the next lesson, we're going to learn about tagging. So if you're ready to keep learning, then I'll see you in the next lesson.